See, Brent, Brendan's our guinea pig in a lot of things. We let him try things. Let us know how it turns out. Don't do this. Do this. That'll be a new segment like in two months. It's life advice from Brendan Howe. I, I still I still burn like 470 calories, but I had to quit like two-thirds of the way through. It was like, I, like I can't breathe right now. I just want to be able to run a mile again. <laughs> I just want to start there. See, my friends and I play December 1st as our turkey bowl, and I'll be in full shape. You're just mad you can't take part. I'll invite Will. Oh, what? And burn all your friends like I did you up at Armco? <laughs> Come on. The question I was asking myself last night as I fell asleep, when's Brennan's beard going to come back? <laughs> <laughs> if you shave yours off, how long does it take to grow back? Like to that length? Oh, this is this is a good two weeks, literally. Two weeks. But I'm glad because I don't want to be, I don't want to be like, a full beard guy. I don't want to. Well, I, I get to a point. Honestly, where the reason I'm there, I, I, I've just been too lazy to shave. I get to a point where I like when it's bushy, but then I feel like my face looks way too full. Like it looks like I have like acorns in my cheeks, like a squirrel. <laughs> like. Today's episode is sponsored by Butler County Chamber of Commerce, Sprinkles Neighborhood Market, Robert Stevens Custom Jewelers. R.W. McDonald & Sons Incorporated. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting Eye on Sports. So, Brendan, you're a Steelers fan. You're somewhat of a Penguins and Pirates fan. And everybody that talks to you for more than five minutes knows that you're an Ohio State football fan. What is, as a fan of those teams, what's the hardest loss you've ever had to choke down? That's a good one. Um, we got three minutes, and we got to talk too. So. I'd say any loss that Ohio State has had to Michigan, um, because the first ten years of being a fan of them, I never saw them lose to Michigan because I started cheering for them in like 2012, and then they ducked us in 2020. You know, Justin Fields and <laughs> would have scored 90 on them, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say last year was particularly rough. I was watching it at my brother's apartment, and I joked around with him and his now fiance after uh, Kyle McCord threw the interception to seal the game that I had to avoid like punching their 65-inch TV. <laughs> I said, I was going to break it. And Neil said, his fiance said, that if I would have done that, I would have never been welcomed, welcomed over ever again. So, um, yeah, I'd say I'd say any Ohio State loss in Michigan. As a Philadelphia sports fan, Jake, what's uh, what's top on your list? Uh, easily the the O four Super Bowl Patriots Eagles, basically because that was the moment that I came to believe I would never see a championship team. Oh, um, I was proven wrong, thankfully, fourteen years later. But after three years of making the NFC championship games and thinking that team was going to win it all, all the time. And then they go up against the Patriots and I, admittedly Patriots were the better team that year. Um, losing that game. I was just like, yeah, I'm going to be like every other Eagles generation and never see a, a title. Um, and that, that kind of sucked. Were you a big Terrell Owens fan? No, I knew exactly oh, how I called on, it. Man. I called exactly how that was going to play out. I was like, he's going to be on his best behavior for a year and he's going to blow the whole thing up in, in a year after that. I think Terrell That's Owens exactly awesome. what he did. He was a great player, but he was a nightmare. He on played your team. with a broken leg in the Super he Bowl did. for you. It, it would have been a Ungrateful. blowout. It would have been a blowout if he. <laughs> hey, I was honest from the beginning. I didn't want him on the team from the beginning. He played well while he was there. I'm. I'm not going to say that he didn't. He obviously, like, if he wasn't in the Super Bowl, I think it's like a 38 to 12 game. But I, I did not like him, and I don't. I, I don't. You know, I knew how it was going to go, and it did. That was one of the first Super Bowls I remember watching. So. <laughs> My first was Packers Broncos. As you guys know, I'm first and foremost a Steelers fan. If I'm watching one team the rest of my life, it's a Steelers. That said, the toughest loss I've ever had to take as a fan was the 92 NLCS. Third straight year, the Pirates <laughs> made the playoffs. They lost to the Reds in 90, lost to the Braves in 91, get back against the Braves in 92. Game seven, they're up 2 nothing going into the bottom of the ninth. We're three outs away from playing Toronto in the World Series, and – the Braves score three runs in the bottom of the ninth. I, I literally remember just – I was motionless for a half hour after the game. I was sitting in my chair in the living room just staring at the TV. Finally, I, I got the strength up to go upstairs to go to bed, and I, I kid you not, I'm glad I did. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad I woke up the next day, but when I went to bed, I remember thinking, God, I don't care if I wake up in the morning. I literally – 
Drabeck was going to go. He was their best pitcher. Bonds was going to go in free agency. He was their best player, one of the best players in baseball. I knew, even as a 14-year-old kid, we're not going to get back for a long time. And they, I mean, they've never been back to the World Series. I mean, their last World Series when I was still in diapers. So it's tough. Was that 92? I thought 92 is when the, the Phillies played Toronto. It was 93. 93? Okay. All right. That ended up on Drake's back-to-back album cover, didn't it? I don't care. You I don't really like, don't care. You don't like Drake? I don't care. <laughs> it's not that I don't like or do like. It's I don't care. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Alter Eagles Ion Sports Podcast. This is our first show since the live one taped at Butler High School on August 9th. That one went pretty well, and we're looking to uh, keep the ball rolling here. I am Butler Eagle sports writer Derek Pida, and I am joined by uh, Eagle sports writer Brendan Howe and sports editor Jake Adams. So uh, one of the things that we've done, uh, we've all contributed to this over the last uh, few weeks, is we've talked to non-football coaches regarding fall sports, the cross-country coaches, uh, soccer, volleyball, golf, tennis. And I want to get you guys' thoughts. What stuck out either about uh, what you talk to coaches about or what you've seen the other two of us write about um, regarding the non-football sports entering the fall of 2024. Brendan, what stuck out for you? Uh, what are you looking forward to uh, seeing this fall? So the first story I worked on um, was the girls' volleyball uh, all-star list or preview list. And something that I didn't know going into my conversation with North Catholic coach Amanda Fetter uh, was that the Trojanettes have moved up the classification to the highest classification uh, that Butler and Seneca Valley uh, play in. We're very familiar with that section. Uh, Megan Lucas and Brett Poye say that is one of, the, one of, if not the toughest section in the state and now North Catholic joins. And not only do they join that section, um, they have a senior setter in Siena Casa and a classmate in Ella Cazera that are both really talented players. Uh, I think Siena Casa is going to University of North Carolina to play. Um, Ella Cazara is really strong in her own right. Uh, they were Class 3A state semifinalists a year ago and state runners up the year before that. Uh, so not only are they coming to the section, but they have a real chance, I think, to come out on top of that section. North Catholic's got a really strong... Uh, girls volleyball program and uh, I certainly wouldn't surprise me if they turned another great season this fall Jake how about you I know you uh, talked to several coaches for several sports yeah um, it's it's still all really new to me and probably is going to be for a while and, and names are going to keep swimming around my head and getting lost and confused but uh, I think the one that kind of sticks out a little bit was looking at some of the cross country uh, runners coming back talking to some of those coaches about um, not just the runners that you know maybe did well at Whippeal or, or districts or, or states um, but maybe some of the others that, um, you know, might be new faces to watch for, which is kind of why I wanted to do these lists with you guys is not just reintroduce like old players, quote unquote, old players for 17 year olds, but also to potentially introduce, you know, a new crop of talent that's coming in in any of these sports. Um, but, you know, it, we, we've got the Drew Griffith uh, timeline that's now over here. Um, he, he's now at Notre Dame, uh, probably training right now as we speak. Uh so what happens with the boys cross country scene? Um, I, I'm kind of curious about that one. Girls has a lot of talent too, but you, there's a hole to fill in terms of like who's the guy to watch this year. Uh, I think you know one that's going to be fun to watch a little bit is is Michael Braun Freeport. Obviously, he's probably like the best talent coming back that wasn't named Drew Griffith. Um, but Butler thinks too that it's got some talented players. That it's going to be more like uh, running by committee to to steal a football term that they're going to have a bunch of guys that are going to do all really well, but maybe aren't going to be Drew Griffith type of talent um so you know we'll see if they get back to states uh this year uh in hershey in uh, uh, late october or early november um but yeah i think that was kind of interesting to me and i'm just like it, for me with this all being new it's just really exciting to just kind of i'm going to start recognizing these names more often i'm going to see the kids that have a, a hat trick in soccer you know one or two nights this season and start to be able to remember okay yeah that person plays for currency this person plays for seneca valley this person plays for for butler um so you know that, that's just the fun part for me is, is just kind of figuring all of this stuff out. Traditionally, I mean, literally on an annual basis, um, soccer is uh, the strongest fall sport, and you can make a very strong case that it's the strongest sport um, the whole year round here, uh, even including the winter sports and the spring sports here in high school in Butler County. Uh, one particular player that I uh, really – uh, focused on, and uh, I was just really amazed at how well she did last year as a freshman. Cameron Woods, uh, she's now a sophomore at Freeport, but at last year as a freshman, she scored 28 goals and had 13 assists. She played on 
uh, or took part in the Olympic de- development uh, program last spring. And they have a new coach coming in. Uh, Joe Treglia, who was the coach the last few years there, stepped down. Steve Kukic is now uh, leading the Yellow Jackets, and he just – he took over. He was not part of the program before. When he took over, he was able to obtain some film on Freeport from last fall, and he just said that uh, Cameron Woods jumped off, you know, the screen at him when he was watching these videos. I mean, she's capable of so much, and uh, Freeport went 15-2 and one last year. Uh, they're looking to get past uh, the quarterfinal round, which is where they they fell last year. But I I, I think one very important thing about Freeport this year is they're not just Cameron Woods. They have other players, uh, Peyton Lose and Samantha Lippett, who did really well on the offensive end last year, uh, scoring goals and contributing assists. So I, I think the fact that those two girls are also coming back, uh, that's going to be able to take some pressure off of Cameron Woods because you know Team C, a girl that's only a sophomore, scores 28 goals last year. Um, she's obviously going to be uh, – she's going to have like a bullseye on her back, so to speak. So the fact that Freeport has a little bit of balance, uh, they can take some pressure off of Cameron Wood. That's going to make her life easier, and I think it's going to uh, increase uh, Freeport's chances to get past the quarterfinal round, which is where they fell last year. It's it's so interesting. <laughs> we live in a world where coaches that can come into their programs can be like, yeah, I pulled up film of you. Yeah. I know what you do. Like yeah. that wasn't a thing ten years ago. Now Huddle and all these programs have completely changed this, and <laughs> just go and pull up highlights of of all of these players. It doesn't matter what sport anymore. Now we are going to move into uh, football. Obviously, the first games are being played uh, this Friday, August twenty third, and uh, our preview is going to be coming out in the print edition on Wednesday, August twenty first. And I uh, want to get you guys' thoughts. Uh, we'll start with you, Brendan, about. Um, the questions facing this year's teams and what things uh, what are you most excited to see teams uh, being able to answer as far as posi- positions go who's moving in the new spots I know you talked to a number of coaches during the preseason what are your thoughts so obviously we talked to Butler and coach Eric Christie last week and this was something that I wanted to mention during that podcast and kind of forgot about as we got talking but um, something that I find interesting about their team is they now have a new defensive coordinator. Bill Elliott has moved on. Uh, he was a defensive coordinator and assistant coach when I played there. Uh, but now a guy by the name of Daryl Smith takes over. He was with the team last year. Um, s- what Coach Christie told me was that they don't have a lot of big guys up front, obviously. Uh, Leland Anderson, we talked to him. Uh, we know him and how strong he is. But other than that, and other than a few other kids, there's really not a lot of depth there. So the way Coach Christie explained it to me was they're going to have a ton of athletes on that side of the ball, and they're going to try to bring guys from different directions. Uh, so I think it'll be interesting to get out to a Butler game and see how that defense fares with a bunch of athletes instead of the traditional 4-3, 4-4, whatever you're playing there. Uh, so that'll be something to keep an eye on there, I think. And then also with the situation Nock has, a, has at quarterback, obviously, Cody Mullen, all-time leading passer uh, there, and then – Colts Prankle comes in from Armstrong. And will that be a seamless transition? Will there be some bumps along the road? Uh, that's something that we'll start to figure out this week. Jake, uh, what stands out for you as we enter the football season? I There's two things for me, I think. And, and the second one is a little bit of a 2A, 2B. They're, they're interconnected. Um, the first one for me is we, we won't get a chance to watch this game in person, but that Mars Boone game down in Florida I think is going to be really interesting. Mars is talking about – you know, it wants to make a deep run in the playoffs, play for a, champ, a district championship this year. This is a really tough test, regardless of what Boone's record was last year, which I believe they were five and six down in Florida. Florida tends to be a bit of a hotbed. I can't speak for specifically what their area was like. Tried to do a little bit of research on that earlier today. Um, but even taking that part out, that is a really long, far road game to play. Like for a high school kid of any age to have to make that flight or bus, I'm going to assume they're flying, but make that flight down and try to then get up on whatever jet lag they may have and play that game week one in in new territory. It's I, I don't know how hot it's going to be in Florida on Friday, but it's probably going to be hotter than it is up here. Um, if if they can pull off a win there, I, I think that's going to speak volumes for what this season might be for them. That That's probably the biggest road challenge any team that we're going to have uh, plays this year, week one through ten, doesn't matter because – just the logistics of trying to get that off the ground. So should I cancel my flight out there? I thought I was covering that game. <sighs> Brendan, we talked about this. <laughs> <laughs> they told me they're going to Universal too, so they could have some fun while they're down there. So but you weren't going to cover the game. You were just yeah, going to Universal. I, I've, I've never been to a theme park like that, so I'd love to. Well, 
Derek, I think it costs how have like, you dealt with this? I think it costs like $225 <laughs> to get into the place. At least it's not as expensive as Disney. <laughs> my, my second point, though, um, that, that I'm curious to watch is, is the quarterback situations at, at Butler and Carn City for very different reasons. Butler last year had a rotation at that position. Once Alec Teff went down, they never had any stability. Can he provide the stability that maybe lifts this team to an extra win or two? Carn City, meanwhile, had the really tragic loss of, of Mason Martin due to the collapse in the field. Um, he is home now. It'll be interesting to see. I, I would like to see if he's at a game this year at some point, just being honored at halftime or pregame or something like that. Um, but that team also had a lot of instability at quarterback from what I read from, from you guys last year too. And, and, and both these teams are trying to be a lot better. Um, Butler's just trying to be competitive this year. It's saying it wants to go 10 and 0. That's the bold prediction Tef made you know, during the podcast last week. Um, but, and they're treating every game like a playoff game. Uh, but this goal this year is is be competitive, keep building this program, and and see where you know they can go from here. And if he can just be healthy for ten games, even nine games, that's a huge step up for for what this program was. Same thing with Carn City. Now, what do they do? They get stability at quarterback. They have an offense that seems like it's going to be capable of putting up some points as long as they just have you know the quarterback there to provide that balance and stability. Again, this is a team that at least on paper, from what I'm seeing and hearing from you guys is, and and from their their coaching staff is. They could be really good. They just they just need that missing piece. Now, quarterback isn't nearly as important as it is the NFL level with you know the Peyton Mannings and the Patrick Mahomeses of the world. But um, you know, I, it's still valuable. A stability at any position at the high school level is, is super super valuable. And we're getting a note here from a producer who does a great job with this stuff. Of it's going to be eighty eight degrees on Friday and Mars, which is definitely a step up from twenty the, degrees. Uh, higher yeah. than it is today here. Uh, from it is my phone cold today. I almost had to wear a jacket walking my dog. Feels like morning. fall. It's perfect. Humidity seventy three percent. No thanks. You could. I. I, I don't want to. I, I can't stand humidity. I don't mind hot days as long as it's a dry heat. You live in Western Pennsylvania. I know. Like we have humidity here. I know. I know. But uh, I've never been to Florida, and I. I honestly don't care if I ever get there. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things that, you, you look at our area teams, and even the ones that have good passing attacks like Mars and Knock. Um, everybody wants to be able to establish the run, obviously. And I, I did look this up. I, I think this is uh, pretty remarkable. Uh, I don't know if we've ever had another year where this is the case. Every single one of our teams, every single one, um, either lost their top rusher from last year to graduation or their top rusher has moved on to a different position. Cody Mullen uh, led Knock last year as a, uh, a quarterback who could run, uh, but he, he led him in rushing, and now he's moving on to a position where he's basically going to be a wide receiver. He could see snaps at quarterback. He could see snaps at running back. For the most part, he's going to be a wide receiver. And Union AC Valley has Owen Bish. He led them in rushing last year as a running back. He's moving on to quarterback. So pretty much every one of our teams, um, e even Carn City, who has Luke Kramer, um, who graduated? They have Hunter Shear, but he rushed for 770 yards last year, 10 touchdowns. He's he's pretty much a known commodity. They know what they got there. But who's going to replace Evan Wright at Mars? I mean, Mar uh, he won our scoring trophy last year. Such a great season. Uh, Monotaw, they're looking for a, a new rusher to step into the leading role. Slippery Rock, Freeport, Seneca Valley, all those teams are looking for um, somebody to come in and not just – carry the ball but carry it well enough to to create that balance where they can take a little bit of pressure off of the uh the passing game so i think by the end of the year we're going to be looking at a lot of a lot of kids who kind of came out of the woodwork um and, and led their team in rushing and um i'm sure a lot of them are going to uh, be considered for our sweet 16 but right now a lot of them are unknowns and I'm, I'm anxious to see how they how they develop this year and how strong they can make those those running games for for their respective teams I'm I'm really like that was a note that I had for myself too today as I was kind of thinking about what we wanted to talk about today. It's like it's so wide open and, and to take people a little bit behind the curtain. We talked about this when you were putting together the uh, your preseason Butler Eagle scoring trophy contenders and you had a list of three because it's so wide open and we don't know who's like a lot of coaches are gonna say we're really high on on these two or three guys, but that's really tough to make a list of. Like here are some legitimate contenders. We don't have like a bell cow back that's that's back this year like almost every other year you have at least one mm -hmm. at least one and here it's like it is wide open right so like who who are going to be these stalwarts on offense is going to be i think by week five we have a, a strong feeling for it but right now like it's anyone's guess i i do understand from reading your preview brendan on mars um again they lost evan Wright 
uh, rushed for over 3,000 yards the last two years, but Eric Kasparovich is going to be in the backfield, and obviously he is a really good athlete, but um, as a quarterback two years ago, he actually rushed for, I think it was like over 400 yards, but this is a new position for him. He's going to be the running back now. Uh, of course, Luke Goodworth is the quarterback in his senior year, but uh, I think Kasparovich has great potential at that position, but it's still – to be determined because he's never really been a running back, at least in this offense before. They have Aiden Yoakum, too, who got some mop-up duty last year in most of Mars games I covered being that most of them were blowouts. So they, they have some experience there. Eric Kasparovich has played a, a lot of positions for them, especially from being quarterback to playing safety last year. Uh, he was on our uh, defensive team as a safety, the, the preseason team. So uh, I think it should go well there, uh, especially being that they have a passing attack that we wrote about in the preview that people can read about. Uh, with Gabe Hine coming back just as a junior, and he's going to look from Division One colleges. So, question for the two of you, actually, like with with the way this conversation is going, what is the position group of strength that we have in the county this year? To me, it seems like from what I keep reading, like wide receiver, but uh, is it somewhere else? Like running back, right. we're clearly establishing is the biggest question mark. That, that's I, I would say quarterback. Um, I mean, you look at Drew Ross at Freeport, um, of course, Luke Goodworth at Mars. Um, Colt Sprankle is new to the area, but he mm-hmm. passed for 11 touchdowns and I think 700 yards last year in the first half for Armstrong. So I, I would consider him to be a known commodity, even though he's on a new team this year. Um, I think I, I actually named six quarterbacks to our preseason Sweet 16 team. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I didn't go in thinking I was going to name that many quarterbacks, but when I we, when you look at the talent that we have at that position – um, I, I was pretty much Andrew Lobick, another kid, uh, Seneca Valley. He's going to be a first-year starter, but Ron Butchley, their head coach, just raved about the kid's talent, said he's uh, like the third fastest kid on the team. Uh, obviously, his, his legs are going to be a big part of their offense, but he has really improved over the, um, over the summer uh, with his passing. So I, I would say quarterback, um, again, running backs down – we have to kind of wait and see what uh, who's going to emerge as our top backs. Brent, what are your thoughts on the offensive skill positions? I agree with you there at the quarterback. Um, th- there's a lot of unknowns, like we've talked about at the running back. Uh, wide receivers, th- there's some talented ones around here. Uh, something that I kind of focus on uh, that when I talked to Tim Birch at, at Media Day was the lines are obviously really important too, so we can't leave those kids out. Uh, Nock has a line that isn't the deepest, but he thinks that it's going to be the best line that he's seen, uh, which is really high praise. Uh, so we can't forget about the big guys up front. Hello, and welcome to Beyond Butler, the segment where we talk about sports other than those that happen here in Butler County, uh, usually professional or collegiate. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about Paul Skeens and the Pirates, uh, having been on the slide that they've been on recently. I think it's really interesting that Skeens, who's been kind of the rookie heartthrob uh, for the Pirates this year on the mound, um, if he doesn't finish first or second in National League Rookie of the Year voting, he doesn't get a full year, year of service, which means the Pirates get to keep him for an extra year. Being that the reports that they might not pay him a second contract, the, the hefty money that he'll probably uh, deserve at that point, um, I think it's really interesting that the Pirates could shut him down here in the next few weeks to make sure he doesn't get to that point where he gets those accolades. So with that, um, I am of the opinion that they should shut him down. Um, it's better to have him for a year that could possibly be contending than this year where they've, they lost 10 in a row recently. Slid out of the National League Central race, slid out of the wildcard race. Obviously, Derek here isn't a fan of tanking, and I don't necessarily think this is tanking. I think that it would be... Sitting someone who could be or will be a really big piece of the Pirates going forward, obviously a number one pick. Uh, a lot of pitchers these days have to have surgery on their arms at some point with all the, the innings that they throw, and, and you know that the, the Pirates are really big on their innings counts there too. So me thinking that the Pirates should sit Skeens uh, for the rest of the season, really nothing to contend for at this point. You're playing for pride if that uh I would like to hear Derek and Jake's thoughts on whether Paul Skeens should play the rest of the season or if he should sit. First of all, I, I you're going to be very surprised that I actually agree with you. Wow. I I don't like the idea of teams tanking. When what I mean by that is the players on the field or on the ice or on the court, where whatever sport it is, the players literally trying to lose games on the field of play. That's what I'm against. Um, sitting a guy. Who you know, you know, 
as you said, the next contract Paul Skeen signs, my guess is it's not going to be with the Pirates. So they have to keep him for as long as they can. They're because they've played like a uh, the bad news bears over the last few weeks. They're out of the playoff race. I am totally fine with them shutting him down so they keep him for another year at the end of his Pirates tenure. Um, that to me, that that's that's not tanking. Tanking to me is the players out on the field of play literally trying to lose, and that's what I'm completely at, against. At this point, you've got to see what we have for the future, and that, that's a big thing. They, they made these trades at the deadline. They, they do well right after the deadline there where they're, they're playing the Astros. I think they swept the Astros, if I remember correctly. Everyone's excited, and then suddenly it's just a nosedive. So with that... I went on vacation. That's what happened. <laughs> why, why pitch schemes if it's not amounting to anything at this point? I, right, Jake? I, I think... There's there's two main things to consider with this. One, if there's such fear that the Pirates aren't going to pay him a, a, a first con, let's call it a first contract, because really like his rookie salary it doesn't he doesn't have much of a choice other than to just not accept, and then he has to sit out for an entire year because his college eligibility is up, um, and that's just not an option. He's he's kind of hamstrung in that way. But uh, the first thing with this is what kind of message does that send if you got a guy who is an, a likely NL rookie of the year candidate like probably going to win this thing is if he pitches through the end of the year um that you you pull him just for for service time it's going to tick off the players that that are on this roster that are the younger ones like the Swinskis and the Skeens and everyone else on the roster that maybe in two or three years are trying to actually legitimately contend and you basically tell uh Skeens that we aren't going to test you right now. And, and like, if I'm his agent, I'm not uh, like, if they do that this year, I'm just like, you're, you're not going back to these guys ever again. They're not, they're not a serious ball club if they're going to do this. But the, the second thing too, is the CBA, the way that's written now that if you get, as, as Brendan mentioned, a rookie of the year award, you get one less year of service time before you get to free agency. That was negotiated by the players association. If the pirates with one of the biggest names in baseball right now, Skeens is one of the biggest names in the sport right now if they do this the cba or the the mlbpa is going to lose its mind because they specifically fought for for uh clauses like this to prevent teams from doing what they were doing with a lot of rookies coming up where they'd manipulate their service time and start them in june when we were clearly ready in march uh, to do this now it, it's gonna like the, the mlb and mlbpa are on tenuous terms to begin with they barely got through the cba without uh, impact and, and it impacted the preseason to begin with and started the season a little bit late, I believe too. This, this would cause a fight. And I, man, like I, I get it from a business perspective and, and, and salary manipulation, and everything like that. But from like the, if I'm MLB, if, if I'm uh, you know, the, the Manfred and everyone else in charge, I'm pressuring the pirates not to do this because you need you need baseball to continue continue to ride this wave that ride this wave that it's on and, and if they do this it's really going to hurt it. Yeah, I, I get the whole kind of personal side of it, but at the same time, there's teams like the Yankees and Dodgers and and it's it's like beating a dead horse, but they can sign Otonis. Skeens is going to end up with one of the, one of those. I guarantee you. I'll bet you right now he's going to end up with the Dodgers or the Yankees at some point. And I don't know the, the fact that we've had to wait so long to. Make the playoffs even. It's been like a decade at this point. It is really bothersome. If if they don't sit Skeens and he ends up going to another team a year before, you know, obviously the Pirates would want him to, you know, is baseball going to step in and, and say, hey, you know, we're we're going to help you guys sign Paul Skeens. Here's some money from Major League Baseball. Obviously that's not going to happen. My point is when you have a a, a sport where there's no salary cap, and you have teams like the Dodgers and the Yankees spending just incredible amounts of money. I mean, to me, that this is this is the small market end of baseball. This is what happens. And I understand what Jake's saying about um, the ramifications, but um, to me, if you're a, if you're a small market team as the Pirates are, I think you got to. It's not like they're taking them out of the rotation and they're a game out of the playoffs. If the Pirates hadn't done so badly over the last few weeks. This wouldn't even be a, a consideration. They'd still be in the playoff spot, uh, playoff race, and uh, you know he'd still be in the rotation. But um, teams like the Pirates have to. Sometimes you have to do what you got to do to keep star players. Hey, if we can't unfurl a championship banner, at least we have the Paul Skeens Rookie of the Year banner, huh? On to our high school football picks for the week, and uh, we're going to start off here with Butler. Their first game as an independent. The last four years they played in District Ten. 
Now they are not affiliated with any district. Uh, they're hosting Shaler. Um, Jake, how do you see Butler's home opener going here? I appreciate you throwing this to me first, being the new guy who's not seen a single one of these teams play ever. <laughs> so put me Either of I, I, I haven't seen Shaler in like six years. So. <laughs> um, I, I've got this one being 27-23 Butler. I think just because Butler's got a little bit more stability at quarterback right now, assuming Tef, you know gets through game one uh, healthy this year. Um, Shaler, from what I, I've seen, um, you know, reading some of the previews around the area, has lost a lot on both sides of the ball, and they have a new quarterback that they got to break in. Um, so I think, it, you know, Butler is is going to try to be competitive. These are the games that you got to be competitive, and you got to beat these teams that are coming in a little bit, yeah, you know, uh, unsure of themselves, maybe. Uh, so I give it twenty seven, twenty three, Butler. Brennan, are you going with your alma mater? So one of the last times I saw Shaler, Jake mentions he's never seen either of these teams play. One of the last times I saw Shaler. Uh, they were on a 31-game losing streak, and they come to Butler, and they beat a team I played for. So um, get a little get back here in this game. Uh, both are new-look teams. Shaler has two returning starters on offense, if uh, I remember what I read in the previews correctly. Uh, kind of like what Jake said there, I am drinking the Butler Kool-Aid. I'm going to say Butler is going to win this one pretty close to me. 24-22, but they are going to pull out a win to start out their era as an independent school. My guess is it has been a long time since all three people, whether it was uh, me, you, and John the last few years or Mike Kilra before that, it's been a long time since all three people picked Butler, and it's going to happen today because um, Butler's coming off a 2-8 and eight season. Shaler was 5-5 five and five last year, a decent record, but they went 1-4 and four in conference play, didn't make the playoffs. They have two starters returning on offense, just two, four on defense, as Jake said, uh, you know, sometimes when you you got a, co- a team coming to your place and they're a little bit down, a little bit unsure of themselves, which I think Shaler is um, after having to replace so many starters. I like the home team in this. I like Alec Teff. I like his confidence. We saw that on our last podcast. I'm taking Butler uh, 21-17, a sweep for the Golden Tornado. I believe, Brendan, you're going to this next game. Is that correct? I am, yep. Monotaw at Carn City, uh, the biggest rivalry in Butler County, at least as uh, far as I'm concerned. Uh, Carn City coming off a playoff season. Monotaw try, trying to get back there. Brendan, uh, what result do you think you're going to be witness to on Friday? Well, I consider anything outside of Butler uh, as Pennsylvania, so I will rebrand this one as the Pennsylvania Classic here. Um Carn City has <laughs> Jake's laughing over there. There go there go our listeners. <laughs> Carn City uh, has a very reliable run game. No matter what year it is, every year that I've been here, uh, they've had a run game that has been dominant. Uh, Monata didn't have that successful season last year. Uh, probably some carry over there, but I think Carn City's run game is going to figure big in this one, and they'll win this one, thirty-one fourteen. I'm going to um, jump in here before we go to you, Jake. Um, I think the the biggest factor in this game for me here is uh the collective running game for each team on on Monotaw's side you have t- uh three guys Cole Scott Jesse Colmeyer and Levi LaCava who combined last year for about 300 rushing yards 300 Carn City's top running backs entering the season Hunter Shear, Owen Higginbotham Braden Slater combined for over 1300 that's a thousand yards difference there um you know, I, I think there's a lot of questions that need to be answered for Monotaw on the offensive line, uh, the passing game, and the rushing game. So maybe we're talking uh, about some positive things that Monotaw has been able to do on offense here um, two, three, four weeks from now. But going into this first game uh, against a, a very strong Carn City team, I just I like the Gremlins' chances. They're playing at home, and I have them winning 28-16. to 16. Jake? I appreciate that you did most of the research for me here. Basically, I have the same thing. It's it's the more experienced run game for Carn City over Monotaz that I think is going to make a, a difference. And, and granted, this series has been six straight for Carn City by blowout. Like none of them have been particularly close here. I don't see that changing right now. I, I think the other thing that's going to really swing this is, and, and Derek, you did a good story on Carn uh, City's uh, pass rushers here. Probably not going to have a whole lot of pass rushing to do in this game. It's going to be a very run heavy game, from what I understand about these two teams. Um, but even still, they're going to be disruptive in the backfield. Maybe that forces a couple extra turnovers, gives, gives Carn City a few extra possessions. I'm going 45 14. Yeah, Mason Bell and Troy Nagel, those uh, two dominant defensive ends that Carn City is going to bring into this game. And as you mentioned, they're really good at rushing the passer, but when the teams rush the ball, yeah, they're going to be good there too and stopping the run. Um, Kiski area, a 5A team, a class 5A team, visiting. 
Saxonburg on Friday to play Class 4A knock. Uh, Brendan, how do you see this one turning out? Well, as we know from past episodes, I'm not a fan of Kiski area. <laughs> I trust in Timber Chet's offensive prowess. Uh, Burning that le- uh, listener bridge right there, too. He's got out of Butler County now. He's got Kiski area. <laughs> just like gonna check off the rest of Pennsylvania soon. Yeah. I want to be public enemy number one. Um, <laughs> with that, uh, Kiski area um, didn't do that well last season. I think they were five and six. Uh, and knock last year came about a few s- plays away from the conference championship. So I trust in Timber Chet's offensive prowess here. Uh, he's really brought that offense along. Um, I think in our, the preview that I wrote, he kind of touched upon how the points per game for knock has grown in the two seasons he's been there. And it hopes to, he hopes to climb over 30 points a game in this one. I'll give them over 30 points. I'll say 31-17, knock wins this one. Jake? I'm going to go 37-20, knock. I'm not sure, just with the, the moving parts in this offense of the skill positions, how many points this team is, is capable of scoring week to week. I, I, but that's to say, like, I, I don't know where their ceiling is going to be at. Maybe it takes another week or so for them to gel here with Sprankle at QB and, and Mullen and those guys moving around. I still think they're going to put up a ton of points, obviously, but I'm curious. Like, I don't know. I don't know exactly what to make of this just yet. This will give us a good barometer. Kiski's got too many question marks right now um, for me to think that this is going to be all that competitive. So I'm going knock 37 20. Yeah, I have to agree. Uh, kind of echo what you just said there. We, um, our cover story um, in the tab is on Knox offense. Out and Wednesday. Out Wednesday. Um, you know, Cole Sprankle coming in after a. a Great half of a season before he got hurt at Armstrong. Cody Mullen, a great athlete, moving to another position. Caden Spencer, a very reliable receiver receiver who should see more passes thrown his way this year. But opening game, how many wrinkles do they still have to iron out? I, I think that is a question. Um, I do think uh, Knox defense is also going to uh, come up with a, uh, several big plays in this game. I see it being rather close, though. Um, I, I like the Knights to win at home 30-22. to 22. Uh, I believe the game I'm going to be at this week, Bethel Park at Seneca Valley. Brennan, you were groomed to not like the Raiders, at least in high school, but you got beat by them every time. So what are your thoughts on this Seneca Valley team opening the season? Well, I initially was in the Seneca Valley School District when I was in elementary, in elementary school. Uh, my senior year, Butler didn't do that well, obviously, and Seneca Valley made the Whipple final. So uh, it kind of hurt knowing that if I was South Seneca Valley, it would have been a little different, um, my experiences. But – uh, this is kind of one of those games of the unknowns. This might be the hardest one to pick. Uh, Bethel Park does have a lot returning. Seneca Valley uh, missed out on the playoffs last year. So this this will be, like as, as Jake said, a good barometer to see where Seneca Valley's at. So I will go with Bethel Park winning this one in, in a pretty close game, 21-19. Uh, to 19. Jake, do you agree with Brendan? I agree on the on the winner there. I have Bethel Park winning 28-21. I, I think you know, both of these, the last two games in this series have been high-scoring um, I think there are two more experienced defenses this year, though, so that's why I'm dropping the score a little bit. I think the last year was like 42 to 35 or something like that. I don't quite see that many fireworks this time around. Uh, but Bethel Park, just from what I can see, again, a lot of this is me just trying to read reports and, and, and follow what you guys or other papers around the area are writing. Um, you know, my predictions don't take them with a huge grain of salt right now. Hopefully I'll, I'll get a little bit tighter with them in the coming weeks. But I think BP seems to have a little bit more returning talent on both sides. I think that's going to be the difference maker here, and it'll snap a four-game losing streak in this series. Did you get a score? Did you give a score? Yep, 28-21. 28-21. Okay, um, one guy who was expected to return for Bethel Park, um, Ryan Petrus. Last year he was third in all the whip bill in receiving. Uh, I don't know how bad he's injured, how long he's going to be injured, but I, I have heard from a very – Reliable source, a source close to the situation, as the AP likes to say, um, that he is not playing in this game. So that's obviously a big weapon for Bethel Park to try to make up for. Uh, Seneca Valley has Jaden Price. Um, A lot of people are making a big deal about what he can do on defense. He's going to Toledo as a safety, but he's also a receiver, and I think he's going to make life easier for first-year starting quarterback Andrew Lobig. Um, He's Big, I'm talking about Price here, he's 6'3", big target downfield. He's one of several big targets that Lobig has uh, has the opportunity to throw the ball to. I actually like Seneca to start the season here with a win, 20-13 to 13 at home. I believe that's our first uh, disagreement here on this show as a staff. Derek wants to fall behind in the standings right away. <laughs> no, that's, that's it, that's it. All right, we're going to uh, just give our picks for these last few games, gentlemen. Um, 
Oh, we got uh, we still have Freeport, Indiana. Second, the last one on the sheet. Um, Freeport at Indiana. Indiana coming off a two and eight season. Freeport was three and seven last year. Uh, both struggled um, in 2023, but uh, this game, even though it's non-conference, uh, could uh, kind of pave the way to success for the winner. We'll have to see. But uh, Brendan, who do you see winning this one? You know, I can't pick against Freeport, right? I yes, think actually I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think Freeport uh, really learned some lessons last year, and from what I talked to Coach John Gay a lot about, uh, he's really excited about this team. Um, Indiana kind of has some things changing around, so even though they're on the road, Freeport is going to start the season off with a win. Uh, I will say twenty-eight to twenty. Jake, I agree with the twenty-eight. I'm going to say it's thirteen though for Indiana. I, it, to me, what it looks like is Indiana is kind of in Freeport's position a year ago. A very young roster, a very raw roster. Uh, trying to to uh, build itself back up, which is what Freeport did a year ago. Now they the Yellow Jackets seem a little bit more uh, capable. They're still not like the most veteran team out there, but this is a better built team that uh, they think has some more skill, uh, has gone through some of those battles. They have a new offensive coordinator offense. So I think that's the one question mark there is like, how quickly will this offense click and, and, and gel together against in this game? But you know, I think they still don't have too much trouble against Indiana. Derek, Derek knows I can't pick against Freeport, but Jake is unaware of why I'm a, a Freeport homer. Okay, you give him that information. Let me make my pick. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, John sent me out to Freeport my first few years here a ton. Uh, so I kind of have a, a, a somewhat of an emotional attachment to their success. It, I, I like to see them succeed. Does he know how journalism is supposed to work there? <laughs> Do you know what bias is? I'm impartial. Do we need? Do we need to? <laughs> he's not. <laughs> I'm impartial. Yeah, he's. Uh, he's. I think he's got uh, Freeport underwears on right now, but um, I'm not looking. <laughs> Freeport. Uh, obviously, a lot more goes into winning and losing a football game than the play of the quarterback. But I do think the fact that uh, Freeport has Drew Ross at quarterback, he passed for over a um, thousand yards last year, thirteen touchdowns. I, I think he's. Uh, prime to have a better year, and I think it starts this week on the road at Indiana. Um, I'm picking Freeport to win this one rather easily, 27 to seven. All right, now the, here's the game that uh, Brendan was hoping to cover: uh, Mars at Boone. Apparently, I, from what I read, Boone's um, just outside of Orlando. Jake, none of us have much information on this game, so I'm going to go to you first here. Uh, do you like the planets to go down to Florida and come back with a victory? So just just to to give a little bit uh, of a quick wrap up here, these last couple games, right? We're just giving basically our score who we think wins. Yes, correct. All right. Yes. So uh, I really don't have any idea. I'm going to go 34 21 Boone on this one just because I think of the home field advantage. Boone 30 to 21. Brendan, that 88 degree weather won't be anything for Mars. Offense will be clicking right away. 35 13 win Mars. Seton LaSalle against North Catholic. Uh, Jake. Home cooking goes North Catholic's way, 28-20. Brennan? North Catholic, 24-17. we got to be a black sheep here. Seton LaSalle, 24-7. Slippery Rock at Fairview, going up to Erie for the Rockets. Jake? I'm going to go Fairview, 23-14. Fairview, 30-10. Fairview, 14-7. Union AC Valley at Red Bank Valley. Jake? 34-28 Red Bank Valley, I think. My score is kind of similar to yours. I think this is going to be the game of the week. I really do. I'm picking the Bulldogs to beat Union AC 28-24. Brendan? Red Bank Valley 42-17. And finally, our last game of the week, Saturday, 1230 out in Herman, Frazier at Summit Academy. Jake? With so many questions I don't have answers to with both of these teams, I'm going to go 35-7, to Frazier. 18-16, Frazier. Summit Academy is a little bit bigger this year in terms of rosters. I'm going to have them winning a close when they went winless last year. Not this year. They will go 21-20. There you have the picks, please. Uh, we should put a disclaimer on those, because especially at the start of the season. When, oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, there they are on the record. Those will come up big at the end of the season in the standings race. Now, uh, this is where I'm either going to shine or go down in flames this year on the podcast. It's a segment called Stump Derek, where Brendan asks me a trivia question, and I have, what do you say, about 10 minutes to answer it? Yeah, actually, <laughs> the entirety of the show, <laughs> as long as it takes you to answer it. So, Derek, can we, can we explain why we're doing this segment, why we felt the need to sure, try to ahead. stump you every week? Go ahead. Well, I think this has become better from you guys, but from what I've seen in the last three months here with you guys, 
there's really not a trivia question, anything pre-2010 that Derek doesn't seem to have the answer to. It's mostly Steelers, but it also imply, applies to baseball and, and hockey, and it's kind of alarming how much he knows, how, He's a how robot. minuscule mm. detail he knows about yes. things. When I'm asking him a question that's like from a baseball player from the 1890s that I don't think anyone in the world has ever heard of, he can name that player. Um, this is This is why we did this segment. That's how, is, that's how I won over my wife, by the way. She was just astounded by my She did confirm knowledge. this on Saturday when we were together for dinner. <laughs> the, <laughs> All the, for, over for burgers. I was going to say, you made it sound like yeah, you that. were out to dinner with his wife. <laughs> I had to correct that one quick. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, if Derek doesn't get the answer, he might dislike me the rest of the day. He might not talk to me. So let's get this underway here. First time. Um, Derek's a huge Steelers fan, as he know, as we know, as he said already in, in the show. Um the Steelers have drafted two Heisman Trophy winners, and they've also had one other be on their roster. So they've had three Heisman Trophy winners on their roster at some point. Who are they? Okay, now I got time to the end of the show here. Yeah. Okay, I I'm, I got it in my memory bank. I'm gonna I'll I'll give my answer by the end of the show. Uh, we are going to head into our final segment, which is. We, we did this with Butler's football players on the podcast live at the high school, but uh, I want you guys to each give me, and I'll give mine, my uh, our boldest prediction for the 2024 high school football season. Brent, we're going to start with you. Don't, don't do anything you're going to regret here. <laughs> my boldest prediction is being that he has an entire season under his belt now. Uh, last year he came into the season with only a playoff start against McKeesport, a traditionally very strong team. Um, Mars's Luke Goodworth was doing really well last season, uh, even after Gabe Hine went out with the injury that sidelined him for the last month. I will say Luke Goodworth not only leads the county in passing, but the entire Whippeal. Wow. All right. You got the assignment. You understand what bold prediction is. I'm going to give mine next. And mine actually deals with Mars as well. Um, Mars and Nock, who are now in the same conference, same class, they will meet for the first time ever in a playoff game this year. Who's Mars covering not that one? Me. Okay, you're covering it. <laughs> I'm going to be up in St. Mary's that night having fun, <laughs> drinking Straub. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to have Mars related uh, content here as well for my bold prediction. We have, I think, four teams that can be contenders for their respective district titles this year. Um, across District 9, 10, and the Whippeal. I think three teams win a district title. Mars or Knock in Class 4A Whippeal, North, North Catholic in Class 3A Whippeal, and Carn City in District 9, Class 2A. I think three of those four teams, which one of them has to knock the other out at, at a bare minimum in Mars or Knock, one, three of those teams win a, a district title this year. Or someone else surprises me, and, one, and, and we get a surprise champion, but I think it's one of those three of those four teams. Okay, now it's trivia time. I need – this is going to be tough, unless it's something I know if I don't really have time to think about it. Um, I, I would say as long as you get the first two, you get this question. No, 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 the, the third, no, 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 the third no, 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 is tough. No, no. Not, after, not after the boss man talked me up over here <laughs> about how any Steeler question pre-2010 I'll get. I hope Beth's not listening to this because i got to tell you, I don't I – don't, uh, the only name I can think of is um, – I don't even think he won a uh, Heisman Trophy. Bill Shakespeare, he was drafted by the Steelers, but he never actually played for him. I think he went into acting. Um, I I I I'm gonna have to answer this to you personally, maybe by the end of the night. But unless you want to give the answers here, I don't have. Well, anything. the the audience should know the answer. Um, they have drafted two Heisman Trophy winners, like I said, uh, in 1946. They used the first pick. Third, their first pick, the Bill. third overall pick of the draft on Doc Blanchard. He was the first junior to he win the Heisman Army. Trophy. He was, yes. I didn't but know the Steelers drafted him. He declined to play pro football and went to serve as a fi fighter pilot in the Air, Flo Air Force and flew 113 combat missions during the Vietnam War. Uh, the next one they drafted, uh, the seventh overall pick in 1954, was Johnny Latner. Uh, he played for the team for a few seasons. Uh, then he also joined the Air Force. In Notre Dame? Yeah, Notre Dame. And then the third, uh, we talked about Ohio State earlier. Troy Smith was signed to a futures contract in 2012. I knew it was a Buckeye. 
And it, it has to evolve a Buckeye if this guy He, he was cut before training camp even started. So that year in 2012, they had Roethlisberger, Byron Roethlich, and Charlie Batch on the roster, which I'm sure Derek would have been able to name there. Um, but yeah, I figured that was a tough one to start out. That with. is a tough one, and I'm going to go stick my head in the sand now. Brendan is 1-0 <laughs> and to start the year. I <laughs> like this. <laughs> Last thing we need to do is is give this guy's ego a boost. I mean, he's like the Antonio Brown to podcast. He's, I think next next week he's going to come in with a fur coat on. <laughs> don't don't try me. I will. I'll go to Goodwill and find one. That's going to do it for this edition of Alter Eagles Eye on Sports. Um, we would like to thank our sponsors: Butler County Chamber of Commerce, R. W. McDonald's and Sons Incorporated, Robert Stevens Jewelers, and Sprangles Neighborhood Market. Subscribe to the Butler Eagle YouTube channel and follow us on social media and check out the uh, print edition of the Butler Eagle as well. A lot of football stuff, a lot of fall sports stuff going in there in the coming days and weeks. Goodbye.